Okay, it is uh, one o'clock here in Chicago and two o'clock in Georgia. So we are going to get started with today, which is the last of a series of three webinars we have done around continuing learning uh, in the current situation that we have where we are all teaching and learning at a distance. My name is Jeff Gumas from Crowded Learning and um, it's been an honor to be able to do all these presentations and help folks get up and running with resources that you can use to support learning um, both now and in the future. I do wanna start off, we have Kevin Sharpton and Carla DeBose from the Technical College System of Georgia. Uh, would either of you like to say anything before I get started? Sure thing, Jeff. This is Kevin Sharpton with the Office of Adult Education. I just want to say thank you everyone for joining us, spending some uh, time with us this afternoon. There's a lot of resources that uh, Jeff, our guest presenter, is coming with us um, on this journey, has to share with you. And uh, he'll also provide you some information about just some of the general chat mechanics. Uh, you'll probably see me providing some things to you off to the side, uh, just some reminders and disclaimers just throughout the show. And if you have questions, uh, definitely we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Jeff. Awesome. All right. Let's get started. So today's webinar is 90 minutes and uh, in it we are going to be focusing specifically on math resources. So last Thursday we did two webinars that were just focused on sort of the laundry list of things that now need to be considered in terms of how are you going to communicate, what content are you going to use with students, how are you going to manage that with students, and we'll, we'll touch upon those things today but with a very specific focus on math. Uh, Tuesday, we did a couple of webinars as well, and those were focused on reading instruction. <clears throat> so today's is going to focus on math, and as Kevin said, before we get started, um, I do want to go over Zoom controls with you. <clears throat> so Zoom is a tool that you uh, may be getting used to at this point, um, whether or not you have been doing other webinars with other folks, you may be using Zoom, you might be using WebEx, uh, or GoToMeeting, which are all tools Zoom is very popular because it is free um, to, a, to a degree. It's free to instructors right now, um, but even in not in a world where, where folks are supporting educators by providing free access to tools that normally cost money, Zoom uh, does have a, a freemium sort of model where the, the lowest end model, which allows you to have 40 minute calls, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, meetings online, uh, is free. So what you are seeing on the bar below are a, a bunch of different tools that you have access to. Uh, the first one I want to point out is your audio settings. So if you click on the arrow here, the up arrow, it's going to show you the options that you have for audio. And if you are leading Zoom meetings, this is why I want to bring this up, uh, you have two options for audio when you join. One is dial in on a phone and then the other is using your computer audio. Now, we know that uh, Zoom is, is going to be a challenge for some folks because they may not have internet access or their only internet access is by their phone. And so this is important for you to consider if you're thinking about using Zoom because Zoom does allow you to just run meetings and just have people dial in. I've used Zoom for a while now in, on the business side of things and we will always have people that are calling in because they're on the road or they're at the airport. And so they can't see what's on screen, but they are able to dial in and participate in the conversation. And so Zoom does take up a lot of bandwidth. And so for learners who might have low data plans or limited data plans, uh, that's a consideration that you wanna take into account. But I just wanna make sure you understand that both of those are options for audio when you're using Zoom. <clears throat> the second thing I want to point out, actually the second thing before I do chat, is the Q&A. Um, Q&A is where we would like you to uh, ask any questions that you have that you would like us to answer uh, during this webinar. And so the reason we prefer that you put it in the Q&A is one, Kevin has access to that and he's kind of going to groom it. And at different points throughout the webinar, I'll stop to see if there's any questions. But the other thing is, if there are questions that we aren't able to answer during the webinar, uh, at the end, we get a, a log of all of those questions and it makes it easy for me to go back in and check out uh, what questions there were and answer them. And so for the past couple webinars, I've sometimes answered ones that are individual, if it's just a question that seems uh, specific to that individual. 
um, or I've shared with Kevin and Carla, hey, here are broader questions that we might wanna answer to everyone in the group. So that's helpful. And then the other tool, raise hand, we're not gonna to use today, but chat is the tool that uh, we have already been sharing with in this uh, webinar. And I see people are already in that. Um, just so you know what the chat window is, when you click on this icon, this panel will appear on the right. Uh, if I'm zooming in here, what you see at the top is the chat log. So this is the continuous chat that's been happening. And then down here is where you can click and enter text that you want to uh, chat out. One thing to note is the default for who you are sending it to when you launch the webinar is just to the panelists. So that's just Kevin and me right now. So if you want to be sending out a chat to everyone, you need to click on this arrow here and select everyone. And then it will say all panelists and attendees. And that means that your chat is going to everyone in the group. So <clears throat> I'm going to uh, actually uh, do a poll right now. And I want you to use the chat to tell me which of these numbers does not belong to the other. So remember on the chat, you click on this and then make sure that you're answering and selecting the arrow to all panelists and attendees. So on this screen, I want you to have the chat open and there's gonna be four numbers that appear. And this is a math question, um, four numbers that appear. And I want you to say in the chat, which one does not belong? Your first impulse. Okay, ready? Go. Lots of fives, saw an eight, saw a 10, <clears throat> some eights. And now we have 46 people here, so this is a little difficult to follow, but think about how you can be asking students. Someone said, depends, you are correct. Uh, we'll get into that in a second, but think about how you could be using a tool like this to be asking questions of your students as you're going. Okay, so anyone who said five, I want you to, in the chat, and you all could do this, why did you pick five? <coughs> Someone's, a bunch of people are saying it's odd, it's the only odd number, all of the other numbers are even. Okay, uh, for those of you who said eight, um, for those of you who said eight, why did you say eight? So I did see a couple eights in here. Well, eight plus two is 10, so that means it belongs. It's not a factor of 10. Great math language, Allison. Uh, so Allison is looking at this from an operations standpoint. Two times five is 10, two and five are factors of 10. So eight doesn't belong. Uh, someone else said uh, that eight and two, she didn't say add-ins, but eight and two are add-ins of 10, meaning that eight plus two equals 10. And that's another reason why five might not belong. Uh, someone in here, I think said 10. So for the person or people who said 10, why would you say that uh, 10 does not belong? It's the only two digit number is the answer. So that's a really great point as well. Um, can anyone make a case for why uh, two doesn't belong? Two is prime. Five is also prime, but it's, it's, it is the only um, prime even number, which is interesting. <laughs> Someone said, oops, that's okay. Um, some other people have answered this, well, it's the lowest number, the other ones are greater than two, and so that's why two doesn't belong, and those are all perfectly acceptable answers. The reason I posed this was, one, to just get in the chat and see how you could use that as a tool, but also as we dive into these resources, you're going to want to be thinking about what are the things that I should be doing in real time with my students, and what are the resources and activities that I can provide them and say, hey, have this done by Wednesday, here's the link, or here's a list of things I want you to do by Wednesday. These are things to do on your own. 
So if you're thinking about using something like Zoom or even sort of a group chat type thing where you're communicating around math or, or, or learning, uh, maximize that time to make it actually participatory and also think about the types of problems that you use that can engage learners. And this is not just a Zoom, we're in a virtual world right now. This is back in the classroom as well. Your class time, especially your, your whole class time or small group time, should be focused on, on conceptual things where you can be having discussions, where you can be asking students to explain their thinking. And the best scenario is where you know there's going to be multiple students that are having multiple responses to the same question, because that allows you to ask students to explain their reasoning, ask students to explain someone else's reasoning, and that's true math instruction. And so that's why we're going to have a little bit of a blended learning slant to today's session, not just the math resources, because we know math is the most challenging subject for it in terms of the, the broad spectrum of adult education. It's the area where most students struggle or the greatest number of students struggle. And this is from Lynx, which is a adult education listserv <coughs> that I really like this quote because it, it really hits the head on the nail, the nail, the, the nail on the head, excuse me, in terms of a lot of times we learn math as procedures um, and, and people know those steps at some point, but as they get into more advanced concepts, particularly if they are GED students, they sort of plateau. Right? And they get confused because they don't actually understand the underpinnings of the math. They don't understand the concepts and why the formulas and procedures that they've learned, why those things work. Um, and so uh, along those lines, when you pose questions like the problem at, that I just posed, you are doing something or allowing for something called divergent thinking. And divergent thinking is the notion like diverging um, where, where a person approaches a problem with a complete blank slate, a complete open canvas in terms of the possibilities of how they can answer that problem. And unfortunately, what we know from K-12 education is a lot of times it's a teacher that walks through a procedure at the start of a lesson and the, the, the learner is being told to internalize that procedure. Then they do another example follow the same steps and ask the student to mimic the steps that they did the first time. And then there you go, that's how you do pick a concept. When we do that, we are, we are narrowing down options for learners and saying this is the only way that you should do this. And we know that there's multiple ways to do that. And so when we look at divergent thinking, this is an interesting study where basically they, they had tasks for five-year-olds and the 98% the of those five-year-olds scored at, at genius level in terms of creativity and divergent thinking because again, it's just like you're a five-year-old. You just you do what you think you're supposed to do in this moment and nothing really matters. And that goes down dramatically over time. And that is because like the way that we are educated tends to be this is the right way. Um, and that, that again just starts shutting down and, and closing the box in terms of how folks are, are believing that they're allowed to think, particularly about math. And so when we're looking at math and we're looking at instruction both now and in the classroom when we get back to that setting, math is a language. Um, I love how someone said two and five are factors of ten. That's great language. That needs to be modeled for students as you're uh, instructing, and that needs to be required of students when they're explaining their answers. Math should be puzzling. You should pose problems like the one that I just did that don't have a one correct answer, that they have multiple correct answers, because that's how students sort of immerse themselves in math and feel less intimidated by the math. A puzzle is fun, a problem is not, right? So make math more puzzling to students and they get more engaged because they can, can converse about it. And then mastery of math requires communication. So we're gonna share a lot of things that are, are great resources like Khan Academy. And yes, they can, they can take practice sets on Khan Academy and answer those questions and you can see the reports. But in looking at math uh, instruction and thinking about what mastery looks like, that doesn't come from a Khan Academy practice sets that comes from providing rich problems and providing rich opportunities for discussions with learners. And that's, that's where you should be spending your face-to-face -face time. <coughs> so today's session, as obviously you know by now, we'll be focusing on math resources. And we're gonna be looking at a number of free and open education resources 
that you can use to build really solid math lessons in a distance learning environment. So right now we're in the midst of setup and doing a time check for myself. Uh, and we are going to look at this concept of blended learning because as I've said in all of these sessions, the things that we're focusing on right now and that we're scrambling to kind of get set up and get into a routine right now because we are in this situation where we are teaching from a distance, as you consider what I want to use both now and in, uh, excuse me, now to, to solve the problems that I have right now in terms of communication, in terms of providing content and provide in terms of assigning content, don't look at it as this is just something that I'm going to do right now and when we get back to the classroom, I'm going to abandon all of those things. Look at it from the standpoint of this is an opportunity for you to learn. We are all learning right now. Really consider as you're doing these things, is this something that I could foresee using in the future? Because that's what you should be focusing your time on in terms of learning right now. Um, if you have a way to integrate these things in the future and provide more options to learners outside of class, when you get back to the class, then suddenly you are a more uh, sort of effective teacher because you can focus your time in class on sort of really helping learners understand concepts and provide them with resources that they can engage with outside of class that allows for more of the individualized work that they can do on their own. So. Uh, Blended learning is a model that really sort of frames how to organize your teaching in a way that facilitates what I just described. So then we're going to spend a fair amount of time exploring free resources and exploring a tool that my organization, Crowded Learning, has created and we just launched last week that allows you to search for skills and then see all of the different activities from a bunch of different resources that align to that skill so that you can pull them together in one place for students or for yourself in your curriculum planning. Uh, then we'll spend a little bit of time of thinking about how do you develop remote blended lessons. So how, since we are fully online right now, what does that look like? So we'll look at the resources that we explore, the Khan Academies and the CK-12s and other things and think, okay, which one of these are things that I could, I could give assignments to and have students work on on their own? which are ones that I should use in a face-to-face, -face, albeit virtual setting where we should be discussing this lesson or we could be discussing this uh, simulation and I could be asking questions so that there's richer learning when we're in a face-to-face -face environment. And then at the end, uh, hopefully we finish a little bit before 3.30, but if not, you are welcome to go at that point, but we will play a game because um, it's just been fun to kind of end these with games using quizzes, which is a fantastic tool for finding um, assessments that you can use with your students or creating your own from scratch. <clears throat> the tools that we'll primarily be using today, we are using Zoom right now. And I always, I always kind of come back to this because I just want people to think about what tools are we using for what different purposes. So Zoom is our communication tool. Zoom is how we're doing this face-to-face -face right now or, or, and how you might do that with your students. And there's other tools that you might use as well for that. Um, assignment management, if you did not, if you were, excuse me, in the sessions earlier this week or last week, I've created a Google Classroom. We have about 400 people in there from across the state of Georgia. Um, and I've been using that to share out sort of sample lessons so people can see, oh, this is how I could create a lesson using Google Docs. Or this is how I could add on a form to a lesson. Um, that allows me to track learner time using a resource from somewhere else. So it's a place that you can join. If you want to join, you don't have to join. But for the next about week, I'll be continuing to pump in some activities and ideas in there for you to share that sort of are follow-ups to the concepts that I've been talking about uh, for the past couple of weeks. Padlet is one that we're not going to really use today, <coughs> excuse me, but it is one that allows for some of the collaboration that we're going to be talking about. I will create an activity that utilizes a Padlet um, in the Google Classroom as one of the follow-ups because it is a really interesting tool for allowing, and it's low tech in terms of bandwidth, that allows students to um, sort of interact around whatever you want to put up, say a video, and then have everyone comment on the video and share one thing that they thought was interesting about it. And then Wakelet will be spending a fair amount of time in, and I'm gonna hop in there now for you to take a look. Kevin has pasted the link to the Wakelet. Wakelet is a content curation tool. 
that is designed for you to be able to pull different websites, to inject your own information in there, um, to pull videos all into one place in a sequenced manner. So <clears throat> it could just be, hey, uh, students, here are the math websites that we're going to be using for the interim. And so I'm putting them all in one place for you. Here's the URL for that Wakelet. It's an app as well. So if you download the app, the Wakelet can just be launched from that app. Um, but teachers and myself, I see it as a great vehicle for building lessons where you can have an introduction, where you can have the resources that you want students to sort of explore, where you can have the lesson portion, where you have the video and the Khan Academy video and the text interactive textbook that provides that instruction. And then you can have a practice section and you can sequence those in whatever way you want and provide instructions for the students all in the Wakelet. So we're gonna to go to the Wakelet that I created for this. Um, and I think I've closed that window, sorry. So Wakelet is the website and you're gonna see that I've created a whole bunch of different Wakelets. Um, and I'm gonna to go to the one that is focused here. So I've created some reading activities. I've created some things for professional development, which is this one that I'm gonna share with you. And just so you can see the process, I've created this Wakelet that um, says start here, and then Skill Blocks is the tool that we're gonna to use to sort of find content. And then the sites that are in Skill Blocks are all here. So CK12, Flexbooks, Math is Fun, Khan Academy, FET, and then I've added more free math resources down here for you to explore as well. So many of you know Math Antics. Here are some great problem type um, websites that you can use for conceptual based problems and some others. So it's, it's a nice place for me to just sort of put all the things that you might be interested in because you're here at this math workshop. All I need to do to share this with you is click on share and I get this uh, to copy. If you use Wakelet, with your students, you can see there's other options for how you can share it out with, including sharing it directly through Google Classroom or for, through Remind, which is a texting app. But I'm just gonna go in the chat window right now and I'm gonna paste the link to the Wakelet. <coughs> Whoops, I think I just did that to Kevin. I need to make sure I'm doing to everyone in the meeting and I'm going to paste it now again. So that should have gone out to all of you. So again, everything that we talked through today is in this Wakelet, every single resource. Um, so that's what makes it kind of a nice tool is it, it's, it's very shareable and it's very easy to provide a home base for students. Um, I just said this, all of the resources are in there. So before we dive into blended learning, before we dive into um, the resources that we're gonna use to facilitate blended learning, um, I've done this at every session as well up to this point. Up front, you need to consider what are you considering for communication? And I'm actually gonna ask folks in the chat right now, I would love you to share what are you using uh, to communicate with your students right now? It would just be interesting for me to see. Um, and, and, and looking at that, we have to think about, yes, you can use Wakelet in Google Classroom. Um, think about um, factors for uh, what are your goals for communication? So do I want real-time communication with my students where we are, we are like face-to-face -face like we are right now? or even we're gonna have a group chat uh, that we do at 11 o'clock in the afternoon or in the morning, excuse me, on Thursday. Um, what do you want to be doing? Do you wanna be pushing out notifications to students? Do you want to um, be reminding them of like a, a live class that you're doing on Friday or reminding them of an assignment that you want them to email to you tomorrow? Um, you need to think about these things. So I'm seeing folks are answering the question that I asked earlier. People are using Facebook, texting and email, emails and text, texting, email and remind. Um, email and text would love face-to-face -face time. Email, text, group me, Zoom, Facebook. So what I'm seeing here is nobody is using one single tool because that's pretty much impossible, right? So. <clears throat> up front, you not only are going to have to think about your goals, but what tools are your students using, what are you using, and what do you have access to, and what do your students have access to. So again, Zoom is accessible to everybody, but some people might not be able to do the video portion because they don't have an internet-connected computer, 
or they don't want to use up their um, data plans. But you could still create Zooms and send out the meeting invite and say, for those of you who just want to call in, here's the phone number. Um, and so they can do that. But uh, in terms of what your students are using, I see a lot of face, a lot of things that replicate what students are already using. So Facebook and using texting and Remind, which is pretty much replicates texting, are all tools that students are familiar with. And so it makes sense to continue to start using those because those are the things that students are familiar with. Not a lot of folks are saying email, um, although some are. And, and it's, it's, you know, we know that sometimes people just don't check their email. And so there's a level of urgency that you need to sort of pin to which mode of communication am I going to use? And then the other question is how synchronous, which means real time or asynchronous do we want instruction to be? And again, as I said earlier, think of this as the time that I spend with students, I really want it to be meaningful and I want it to be rich in learning or even just rich in connection because that's another thing that people are really missing right now. Um, and so, you know, think about what you want to be doing during that face-to-face -face time or synchronous time, which is going to be limited, and then which of these things are things that students can be doing on their own. Um, the benefits of Google Classroom and the reason that I've been modeling in Google Classroom is it does kind of provide a one-stop place for you to be sharing out any assignment, for you to be using any of the tools that we've been talking about. Most of the, the learning resources that we share today integrate into Google Classroom. And it obviously has communication features and you can set your Google Classroom. I've set the one that we have um, where anything that I post, all the students get notifications on their phone. Um, and so that is another consideration to be made. And when they go to that, uh, when they open that notification, it's going to bring them into Google Classroom. Um, so it is a useful tool. There's a reason it's, it's been so popular and taken off in popularity. <clears throat> Our Google Classroom uh, ID or code is this, and I'm going to just hop out of here so you can see how you get to that if you want to join. And thank you, Kevin, as always, for, I know, folks, as that you miss things, um, Kevin is, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I'm going to Google Google Classroom because I don't want the sign in here. So if you go to Google Classroom and you've never used Google Classroom, you'll just come to this page and you can click on Go To Classroom. If you have used Google Classroom, uh, then you'll see a page like this and maybe you're in some classes. I am in my personal account right now. I'm running the class that, that we're doing as part of the, the, the Georgia folks here um, in my work account. And so you, if you are using Google Classroom through an org account, um, you're going to need to um, make sure that if you're signing up for this class that you're doing it from your personal account. So I'm going to join the class and I'm going to go back to the slides so that I see the code. It is CNKP5I3. And I'm actually paste, uh, I'm putting that in the chat so that if folks uh, who have not joined want to join can. I will send this as a follow-up. I do not need you to do this right now. Um, but I just wanted to walk through the steps. So what this is now, you'll see there's a class feed uh, that allows folks to just you know, communicate to anybody. You as a teacher could turn that on or off as you wish. Um, but I've been using it to post reminders. I've been using it to post information on uh, different videos. Here's the video from the reading workshops from on Tuesday. Uh, here's the wakelet from that session. So I've been pulling in different things and then people are just sharing outside. Here's a video I shared about using Google Forms to track student time. Um, so it's just a nice sort of a centralized place. Obviously, again, there's 400 students in here, so that's not normal. You're gonna create classes for your classes and it allows for just sort of everyone to communicate in one place. So that's why I've been focusing on Google Classroom um, there's a reason that folks have been focusing on using messaging tools, again, because we know that that is what students are used to and using. And then as you consider any of these things, both the communication tools as well as the uh, content tools, really be mindful of your learner's bandwidth. If, if you decide that everything is going to be in Zoom and, and you're requiring that folks need to be on there, you need to be uh, mindful of the fact that some students are not going to be able to do that. Uh, so what are your backups for those students? Um, and then also think about, you know, what is the level of immediacy that
that you want students to be working on things and that you want to be available for students. So again, things like Khan Academy, you can assign and just say, you know, work on this on your own. Uh, don't spend an entire time in Zoom walking through a Khan Academy video. Um, or, or you could do that, but maybe only after you know that students are having trouble with a particular concept. So just be thinking about that as you consider this. And as we now dive into the various resources, um, as I've said with all of these, uh, think about what your plan is in terms of how you're communicating, the resources that you're going to use for students to learn, and how you're going to get those resources out in a way that is manageable for students. Because you have to think about what's going to be reasonable uh, for you in terms of how to organize your things. And then you also need to be thinking about your students in terms of what's going to be manageable for them. Um, we're sharing a bunch of tools. We cannot be sending this tool and this tool and this like this link and this link and this link out. That, that will be overwhelming to students. So how are you centralizing that for students in a way that is manageable? Okay, so now we're just going to dive very quickly through best uh, uh, blended learning. And blended learning is something that's sort of sprung up in the last 20 years as online learning has taken off. And the notion is that there is face-to-face -face learning, there is online learning, and as we are sort of exploring both of those worlds now that they are robust, um, and the online learning is more robust, we're realizing that sort of in the middle is the most effective for learners, in particular even adult learners. Uh, that strictly online has its limitations, that strictly face-to-face -face has its limitations. Online, some people just aren't really good online learners. I personally do not do well just being handed things and saying, go learn them. I need to have some type of connectivity um, from time to time. And I learn best when someone is teaching me the concept. Face-to-face, <coughs> -face, uh, only face-to-face -face has its own limitations as well. Um, one of those is it doesn't, it's, it's limited in terms of the personalization that you can offer that online does offer. And it also is limited in terms of everyone has to be there at that time. And so, you know, if, if there's, you know, childcare or work or transportation issues, that becomes a challenge for adults. So it is great that we are all having to teach and learn online because it is an effective means of extending learning for our learners who often have a lot of barriers to being in our classroom physically all the time. But what we are gonna look at in terms of uh, the blended learning model today is what's called the rotation model. And this is just thinking about, here is a concept I want to teach, and I'm gonna provide a variety of different ways in which learners can be learning that concept. It is not just going to be me standing in front of the classroom teaching to a class and then that's it, go home. And so the four models of rotation are station rotation, and this is where in a classroom or in an online environment, you're saying, these are lessons that you can work on on your own. This is a video that I want to make sure all of you watch, and there's a uh, Google Doc that I want you to provide a summary and submit it to me. Uh, this is going to be a Zoom activity that we do together, so I want you to do a couple things beforehand because we're going to be talking about this together in class. And those are all around the same concept. And maybe you're using that as a weekly plan for learners, where you're providing different things that they're going to use and different goals for each of those things, but it's all around the same concept. Lab rotation is, is more of a face-to-face -face environment where you literally have students in the classroom and then you go to a lab and you're doing certain work in the lab and it's just back and forth in that sort of manner. The flipped classroom is very popular and it one, may be one that you definitely want to consider for what you're doing right now. And it's used very, very widely, um, even outside of a coronavirus situation, where the notion of is instead of teaching a concept in class and then giving them homework to see if they know it, the homework is on Friday, we are going to have a discussion on unit rates. I am going to uh, give you a link to this simulation or to this video, and I want you to do those things before you come to class, because your experience is going to be the basis of what we talk about. Was this easy? Was this hard? What did you observe? Um, what did you learn from the video? So that the, the onus is put on the student, and more of the instruction is happening independently, 
And then that frees up the time that you have together to be discussing what you've learned, to be sharing different students' observations, as opposed to you sort of starting at the beginning that this is the concept, this is how you do it. Um, and so a lot of times that could just be a video, watch a video ahead of class. Um, and then a playlist is, as the name suggests, it is a playlist of content resources that allow for different modalities that focus on a particular topic. And you might give the student the option of selecting a few that they might be interested in using. <clears throat> These are sort of um, like amazing examples of what teachers might set up in a classroom. This is a station rotation where uh, students are grouped uh, in different color bands and then they're asked to uh, sequence through these various activities within the classroom. So that's sort of really rotating in a class in a station rotation model. This is a playlist, an example of a playlist where um, there's a variety of options that students can work on and they're gonna work on the ones that maybe they feel best suited for them in terms of the style of learning or what they're being asked to do. Um, and so this notion of station rotation is what we're going to focus on today as we talk about these different resources because it's very learner focused and that's what's really important that the focus is on the learning and not on the instruction. You, we are in a time right now where your instructional time has been shrunk because of the situation that we're in. So we need to think about what are the resources that can allow for independent learning and then how can we bring it back together so that we can talk about what learning has been happening. Um, the other benefit about station rotation, both virtually and when we're actually in, in, a, in a classroom, uh, is that it is more flexible. It allows for more options for students, and you get to work with smaller groups as opposed to being in front of a whole group. Um, modalities are different in station rotation, which is nice. There's always at least some technology portion in a station rotation, even when you're in a classroom environment. And the other benefit of station rotation is it allows for uh, different learn levels of learner engagement. So um, small group, so uh, both with the teacher and with, uh, with students, uh, also collaboration, and then allows for independent learning as well and individualized learning. So now we're gonna dive into the math resources. And I'm gonna take a drink. Uh, are there any questions at this point? I just wanna stop. to make sure. I see Kevin's been uh, answering some questions. Yeah, he's been busy. Good. <laughs> Anything that's come up that uh, you want me to make sure to address to the group? Not right now, but I'll be sure to collect those and get them over to you. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so uh, my organization, Crowded Learning, we focus on uh, free resources. And the goal of that has been to sort of find and, and sort of um, curate what are the resources that adult educators are using? Because uh, free resources, as lovely as that sounds, free, aren't really used that heavily in adult education because of the fact that it's hard to sift through all of these things. So we spent about two years uh, going to workshops, going to conferences, um, posing questions to teachers in terms of what resources are you using. And on our website, we have curated sets of uh, free resources in academic subject areas, in employability skill areas and in what are called 21st century or life skill areas. And so these are all on our website. And again, these are all recommended by instructors. So that was kind of step one to see, okay, what's being used in adult education. And now we're sort of, sort of focusing a little bit more with a new tool that we've developed called Skill Blocks. So it's great that I have a directory on the Crowded Learning website that has all these different great math websites but the onus is still on you to sift through those and to find the resources that relate to what you wanna teach. So the notion of skill blocks is we've created a, a platform that allows you to, instead of having to search all of these various websites that you see on the left and all of the publisher resources that you see on the right that you may be using, instead of having to go through those to find lessons that align to what you wanna teach, what if we organized all of those things together in one place? where you can say, I have these books and indicate that, which you can do in skill blocks. And then you can say, this is the skill I wanna teach. And you can see all of the resources from all of these free online resources and from any of these publisher resources that you have and that you've indicated that you own. 
and you can see them all in one place. So that it, it takes the, the, the legwork out of finding resources that align to skills. <clears throat> what that also does for, for, from my standpoint in terms of making uh, people more willing and wanting to use free resources is it allows you to stick with the, the core curriculum that many of you are used uh, to using from the publishers, be it um, these print resources that we're looking at here or others, and then to use free and open education resources to augment that lesson or to provide additional practice or additional remediation um, or games even that obviously don't exist necessarily in these books. And just to highlight an example that I always use to say, show why that's important, this is a lesson from one of the publisher resources uh, that's newer and it's aligned to TABE 1112. And you'll see here, this is the standard that it aligns to. Now this standard focuses on geometry at TABE level M and what it focuses on are lines, rays, and angles. So it is basically um, lines, rays, segments, line segments, and then perpendicular lines, parallel lines, and then identifying acute, obtuse, and right angles. But the standard actually says to identify them, which is very well done here. We see all of the definitions, we see examples of them here, and then we see how they are named here. And then we see eight practice problems that practice on identifying lines, rays, and angles. But the standard actually says identify uh, them in figures and draw them. And in none of these activities in this lesson does it uh, ask them to draw anything. So does this align to that standard? Absolutely, and it does so very well. But it doesn't fully cover the standard. And many times that's the case in, in publisher resources or even online resources. So it does require us, if we want full coverage, to bring those things together. Now here is a skill block that I created that pulls together those publisher resources, but then a number of the free and online resources that are also in skill blocks. So we see a lot of lessons in here, but then we also see these three practice, and within some of these math is fun lessons, they do manipulate things to draw. <clears throat> and then we have Khan Academy practice sets identify raised lines and line segments and draw raised lines, lines and line segments. Draw, excuse me, identify parallel and perpendicular lines, draw them, identify angle types and draw them. So we're getting richer and more in-depth coverage of the standard by bringing these things together. On our website, there is a, on the Crowded Learning website, um, we do have a skill blocks page. That is where you'll get information on, on upcoming webinars on this tool, which we are now going to walk through in a, in a sort of turbo manner. Um, but that's also where you can launch skill blocks and just find a, a, a number of resources that relate to uh, skill blocks. I did not mean to click on that, but here we are going to the second thing on this screen, uh, which is on YouTube, we have a YouTube playlist of tutorials on how to get set up, how to find skills, how to select lessons and activities, how to organize content. And these are all bite-sized little chunks. Um, so we have videos and all of that, as well as recordings of longer webinars that we've done. Literally, Skill Blocks came out last week. So this is a brand new tool. <coughs> um, the other nice thing about Skill Blocks in terms of the resources that we've brought in is all of the free resources that we have are mobile friendly. We understand the fact that many learners do not have access to the internet and, or a broadband computer, excuse me, a computer that is connected to the internet. And so they are mobile dependent for any online access. And so all of the activities that we've put in here from these free resources are mobile friendly. So we're now gonna dive into these resources. Uh, you've heard of Khan Academy, CK12, FET, Flexbooks and Math is Fun may all be new to you, but they all offer a range of different experiences for learners around math. There's over 2,000 uh, standards aligned lessons, activities, games, simulations within skill blocks. And it allows you to, again, bring them all together in one place. The Wakelet, as I've already shared, has uh, links to all of these resources on their own. So we are now going to build a skill block together. And the focus is going to be on unit rates. So uh, the reason I'm picking unit rates is the other day, actually a couple weeks ago, I was at U-Haul because I needed to move some furniture um, from a friend's place to my place. 
and uh, they, they had these signs up. And so while I was waiting, as if you've ever been to U-Haul, you will wait in line for a while. Um, they had these signs up that uh, were, were suggesting that they have all these great deals on, on boxes, moving boxes. And they have the price for each box, but then they have bundles of 10 are only this, and this is how much you save. So I was looking at this one in particular, where it was $2.33, and it says bundle of 10 is only $23.30. And I was like, wait a minute, $2.33 times 10 is $23.30. There is no savings here. And then I looked, and these I could not do in my head, so I pulled out my trusty calculator, and lo and behold, none of these is a deal. The bundle price is the same per unit price per box as the if you just bought one box. Uh, so I share this not because of that experience, and that's why I'm thinking of unit rates, but this could be a problem that you pose for students, uh, that you give them ahead of time and say, hey, it's, it's sort of the end of unit experience, uh, excuse me, end of lesson uh, problem that I want to discuss with you in real time. And so we could look at uh, this together and, and talk about well, what were your answers and why. None of these is a deal. The reason is normally when you buy in bulk, the pot cost per unit goes lower, doesn't stay the same. So this is kind of false advertising. I see a question in here. I don't, I think it's just um, some sharing is happening in the chat. Thank you, Kevin. <coughs> so now we're gonna dive into skill blocks. And I am going to hop into, uh, it is skillblocks.org. And you could create an account right now, it's free. Uh, you just go in here. I'm actually gonna just use my existing account, which I've created a number of different skill blocks. And what you'll see is these are in different subject areas at different levels. It indicates the number of activities and there's access codes that I can share with students for them to see the skill block and see all the resources within. On day one, none of this exists. And uh, this question got asked last time, so I'll just answer it up front. There's a manage library button at the top that allows you to add in publisher resources. So I've added in a bunch of different resources from various publishers. Um, what that means, it doesn't mean that I now have access to that book. The reason I've added that is I'm saying this is a book that we have in class, so I want to see what lessons from this book align to the skills that I want to teach. Um, and you can see that if I go to add print resources, I can search through everything that's in the library. There's nearly 300 resources. Um, I can go to resources that are known. These I've already, I, I keep hitting enter and I didn't mean to. Um, I can go and see, excuse me, any of uh, the resources that I've already added. Uh, I'm going to, brr, 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 let's try this. So I've already even added these in, but um, so I've already added a bunch of resources to my library. All I need to do in order to um, add something to my library once I see it is click on it and click save, and then it is saved to my library, that's it. And so then again, all this means is that these resources have a number of activities that align to skills within the skill blocks database. So it's just gonna tell me for any of these skill blocks that I create, are there lessons from those books that align to that particular skill? So we're gonna start from scratch. I'm just checking the chat. There is no app for skill blocks, but it is very mobile friendly for students. Um, so we did not mobile optimize it. They just need to go to skillblocks.org uh, one thing I always recommend for, for any tools like this is to have them just down, like when you're on an internet site um, on, their, on their phone, you have the ability to add that site to your home screen. And so that is something that you can do. So I'm going to create a skill block on unit rate. And again, this is a fly through of the process. It's very, not really that complex, um, but I've been doing sequential webinars uh, that go through the steps that I'm now going to go through very quickly as someone who knows how to use this. So my students are TAVE level M. One of the things that uh, this is just CCRS levels right now, we are waiting for TAVE to give us their, uh, on, in the standards, there are called subdomains. TAVE has sub skills. And uh, what we're going to basically have once we get those from them is the ability to click on TAVE the levels will be L, E, M, D, A, and then the things that appear under each of these domains 
are the subskills. And those subskills from TABE are the very things that appear on a, that appear, excuse me, on a student's uh, TABE test report. So I'm anxious to get those because it'll be very helpful. But right now we're gonna do this lesson on unit rates. So I'm gonna to go to the standard or sub subdomain here that I know focuses on rates and ratios. And you'll see now that there's a number of things um, within here that align. There are a total of 25 lessons and activities in my skill blocks library, which includes the free resources and the print resources that I've added that uh, align to this skill. And you'll also see that this uh, subdomain has two standards. It has this one, which is focusing on understanding ratio concepts, which is six ratio and proportional relationships one, and then this standard, which is focused more on unit rates. So I am going to say that we're just gonna focus on unit rates. So I am gonna focus on the lessons uh, that are covering that concept because that's the one that I really wanna focus on. So we see here's from Flexbooks unit rates. We see that from Khan Academy, we have comparing rates and we have another unit rates uh, in practice set. And then we see from math is fun that we have ratios. <coughs> Excuse me, we're not gonna do ratios. We're gonna focus on uh, unit rates, but I wanna see what these activities look like. There is a lesson on unit price and there's a unit price game and math is fun as well. So I'm gonna add that. And then I see a FET, which is a simulation. And then I see um, two book lessons that I'll pick here that focus on unit rates as well. So I have selected a total of 11 of these activities. I'm now going to save it and voila, I have a skill block. There is a code that I could share with students, um, but we're not going to do that just yet. And I am going to give this a name. If you noticed on my dashboard, you saw everything started with level M or level D. I do that because it makes it easier to sort them because those get listed in alphabetical order. So we're gonna make a skill block on unit rates. Now skill blocks is a, we now have all of these resources together. I kind of need to look and see, well, what are these resources? So you're gonna see every single one of the things in here, we're now gonna hop through, but just so you see what you're looking at, these are listed in alphabetical order by the provider. So CK12 is first and Flexbooks are also CK12. All of these are links that will launch out the uh, actual resource so that you can go and look at it. And you'll see this screen in the slideshow in a moment, but CK12 has these really great uh, content sets all around, in this case, unit rates. There's a reading, there's an interactivity, there's a video, there's a practice set, and there's a real world problem. Um, and so uh, that's a great resource. And I can do that for any of these online resources to go look at them. Uh, I also have the ability to copy these things to my clipboard if I wanna paste them and send them to students through something like Remind. And then more importantly, if I want to actually share this skill block with students, I have the ability to rearrange things in a ways that makes sense so that this is in a sort of sensible order in terms of the content. So first we're gonna look at each of the resources that are in here. And then second, we are going to do that rearranging based on understanding how each of these things work. So Khan Academy, you're very familiar with, right? Um, we know this is probably the most widely used math resource uh, in adult ed, if not uh, all education, because it's comprehensive, excuse me, comprehensive. It's all levels, it's video-based instruction, and there's practice sets. You can create accounts, you can create classrooms, it tracks students' progress within it, and so this is really a popular tool. So we've pulled together <coughs> all of their practice sets. So when you go into Khan Academy and you start a unit of study, this is what a student sees. They see the videos and then they see the practice sets. The only thing that we have in skill blocks in terms of the links are the practice sets. And the reason for that is the only thing that Khan Academy has that's outwardly facing that says here's all of our links and all of the standards alignments is to the practice sets. We've also noticed when we try to link directly to what you see right here, it doesn't work very well. And so it would get really confusing. Um, so mind you, uh, those two things that you're going directly to the practice set. The other thing that you wanna be mindful of if you're using these Khan Academy things uh, in skill blocks 
is that when a student clicks on that link, they're gonna be launched into Khan Academy. Now, if they're on their phone and they have the app on their phone, they will be launched into Khan Academy in their account. Like it'll automatically just put them into that activity in their account. Um, if they're working at a computer in the classroom, which is not theirs, where it might, it's not gonna necessarily automatically remember that, that this is the student because they're working at different computers, you need to make sure that when they launch these, that they are also making sure to log in to Khan Academy. Now, the thing about Khan Academy is you don't need to log in to do anything, but it's obviously helpful for tracking time, particularly if you're using it. So the notion that we're presenting in talking about Khan Academy, since it is linking directly to their, these practice sets, is maybe this serves as a manner of self-guided learning. Now, what I'm, you're showing or seeing here is a alignment to all of these activities that we've actually published on our website. So in skill blocks, it's a database that automatically points you to the things, but we actually have spreadsheet, spreadsheets on the Crowded Learning website that uh, have all of the alignments of all of these resources available to you. So if you choose to not use skill blocks, but you still wanna know what aligns to what, all of these spreadsheets are available to you. So now when a student in skill blocks clicks on this, they're gonna to get to the practice set and maybe you use Khan Academy practice sets as a formative assessment. Uh, so you're doing it at the end of other things that students are working through for their instruction. Or maybe you're using it at the start of the lesson and saying, hey, your tape report said you needed to work on this skill. I'm gonna put the Khan Academy thing up front just to see, do you know how to do this problem? And if you don't know how to do this problem, at the bottom, there's always this link. If you're stuck, watch a video or use a hint. And when you do that, you get this and it shows the related content so that the student can go to the associated video that would help them with this particular concept. I'm seeing a few things in the chat. <coughs> uh, Kevin's just sharing things, awesome. Um, so this could be a sequence that students are working through with those Khan Academy practice sets. But obviously, you know how those practice sets work if you've ever um, used Khan Academy. So there's a variety of different ways that you could use them in terms of being formative checks or summative checks or even um, a diagnostic that you use at the start to see, is this a lesson that you really need to do um, if, if you can already pass the Khan Academy assessment. CK12 was the one I just launched. So for all of the concepts that we have in here, uh, there'll be a reading and an interactivity and a video and a practice set and again, a real world example. And so I really like CK12 because of that. What's different from CK12 than Khan is, whereas Khan, you can uh, look at Khan Academy videos and lessons without having an account. CK12, the student will need to create an account or you could create an account for them and have a class. Um, the you, you can click on a few of them and you might get in for free for a, it, and it is free excuse me you might get in without having to log in for a while but over time it's going to say that you need to log in in order to see this resource again it's completely free it's openly licensed the nice thing about CK12 is with these readings you can uh, assemble those readings and you can create customized textbooks within CK12 um, and and use those with your students CK12 also has a downloadable app that allows them to download these readings and, and, and view them offline. So those are uh, nice elements of CK12. <coughs> Flexbooks is also from CK12, and these are interactive textbooks. Now these fall at table level D and A, some M, um, but mostly D and A, um, or CCRS levels D and E. And so you'll see here, these are the titles that we have within skill blocks, middle school math levels, and then high school math of algebra one, geometry, algebra two. These are great um, because there's tons of interactives within a sort of traditional lesson. Um, they have built in Google Translate, which allows a student to actually click on a pull down and select a different language for the text to appear in. And they are also customizable so that you can um, pull together different things. But in the lesson on unit rates, uh, these four things appear within this lesson. So first there's this sort of ratio thing where they're, where they're prompted to use this interactive to solve a problem. Um, and then they're gonna be asked questions about ratios of blue to red, red to green, green to blue. 
Here's another interactive within this same lesson, like literally right after this, that's looking at cost per uh, four pounds of oranges. And it's a graph that they're asked to manipulate based on a, a problem that's posed to them. Then this is another interactivity where they're asked to drag the terms that uh, signal what a rate is. And then this last interactivity looks at miles per gallon. So similar to this, there's looking at it from a visual standpoint of rates and equations and graphs. Um, and they're asked to manipulate these. And all of these, they manipulate them till they get sort of correct answers. And then they're asked follow-up questions that go with it. So it's got really rich instruction uh, through interactivity. Um, in skill blocks, what they will see is a link like this, and it'll link them directly to the lesson. The start of every lesson has a description of what is in the lesson itself, and it also provides, as CK12 does, these other ways to learn. So many of these are the same activities that are in those CK12 content sets. <coughs> um, you can create classes in CK12, and you may want to if time tracking is important to you because it does track time that students spend in lessons. If you're just sending them in and they're not logging in through a classroom, uh, they, they will not track their time. So that's a really important distinction to make. Um, but you can also assign these things directly through Google Classroom. So on many of these sites, you're, all, you're gonna see this Google Classroom icon and all you have to do is click on it to directly assign it through Google Classroom. But again, CK12 has its own platform that allows you to set start and end dates. And again, if you use CK12's platform for assigning, it will allow you to track time. And this is what that looks like for a teacher in the lesson. So this indicates that this student has spent five minutes and 24 seconds in this lesson. And here is where they are. They're, they're, they're just exploring the concept. They haven't actually done any sort of activities that are checking their understanding. So uh, that's Flexbooks. The next resource is FET. So FET is an interactive set of simulations. And you see on the right uh, an animation of me manipulating one of those simulations right now. Uh, every single one of these, and these are for math and science, every single one of these simulations has teacher guides that go along with them and, and show you how to use the simulation with your students. There's also teacher lesson plans that have been created by other folks who have posted them onto the FET website. And so those can be useful for you in terms of looking at what other teachers are doing and the types of questions that they're asking students as they're using these simulations. Uh, this came up last time and I'm glad I was able to share it. All of these simulations are downloadable, which means that you can download the simulation onto a computer, you can download the simulation onto a server, and the person that asked that question this morning, she, she worked in a correctional setting, and so in correctional settings, they tend to be limited or have no online access, but all of these could be downloaded and loaded onto computers and a, and a server. Um, again, with FET, there are, uh, they have multiple languages of each of these assessments. <coughs> now, in terms of how would you use something like FET, on the right, you see a problem uh, happening right here where the student is dragging fruit to just sort of explore and figure out how can I make equal weights on either side. And in this exploration, what they uh, observe is that two lemons is equal to three oranges and one apple. And so what happens here is once they do that, they can click and create a snapshot so that they remember that weight. So the, the, these simulations are designed for students to self-explore. Um, even with no prompting. Uh, just see what you can do, see what you observe. Um, I would recommend that these be used as sort of upfront things with your students on concepts, maybe some prompting to say how to use it and what they should be trying, but don't like dictate exactly what they're supposed to be finding out and see what observations they make. Then, in a live setting, you could lo load this up and launch it in Zoom and say, okay, class, so we now see that two lemons equals or weighs the same as three oranges and one apple. So we've snapped that and we know that those are equivalents. So what happens if I add two more lemons onto the left side of my scale? How can I make it equal? Um, what, what would I need to do over here in order to do that? And there's multiple answers to that. One answer, I could just add a lemon over here, right? Because um, or two more lemons over here, and it's going to balance because I'm doing the same thing on both sides. 
Another answer could be, well, if I've doubled what's on the left side, I need to double what's on the right side. So I would need to double the number of oranges, so that would be two times three, and I would need to double the number of apples, which would be two times one. So I would need to have six apple, six oranges and two apples on the right side. Um, now I just you know, walked through that with you, but this would be something that you throw the question out to students and then maybe have them answer in a chat. Or if you're in a smaller setting and everyone is live on audio, you could ask students to, to answer out loud. But this is one where the simulation is great as is, but the questions that you can ask students to, to share their thinking is where rich learning is happening. And so uh, I love these things because of that. Another reason that I like these is um, the concept of equality, for example, goes across all math levels. So for many of these simulations, there's multiple versions of it that get into higher concepts. So this is just getting at equality not even with numerals, like no numbers, right? And then we get into using numbers, then we get into using variables, and then we get into using operations. So it's sort of advancing concepts around the, the um, excuse me, advancing levels around the concept of equality. Uh, math is fun is the last resource that is in skill blocks um, that we're gonna look at. And so this is another example of equality. Uh, but it's in a different sense. It's looking at what do I need to do to both sides of the equation in order for me to isolate the variable of x, right? So how do I get solved for x? <clears throat> so this is just one of many of the types of resources that are in Math is Fun. And I, I like Math is Fun because of that. So there are lessons, there are simulations like this, there's interactivities, there's games, there's even hands-on activities. Um, and I like the presentation of content in Math is Fun because it's sort of traditional lesson format. However, it's kind of like Wikipedia. So say it's a lesson on adding and subtracting fractions, and it's talking about the terms numerator and denominator. Well, obviously, if you're, if you're getting to the point of adding fractions, there's an assumption that students know what numerator and denominator means. So the word numerator will be linked, and the word denominator is linked. And so if you click on that, it's going to bring you to a lesson or an overview of what a numerator is and what a denominator is. So again, it's much like Wikipedia, where it has those sort of links to the concepts that connect within the lesson. Uh, at the end of the lesson, it also provides links to more foundational concepts for that lesson, as well as links to other, other lessons and activities that you could use that are gonna provide more learning for you around this concept. In this case, it's comparing values. The Math is Fun lessons also have uh, questions at the end. Now, there are no student logins in Math is Fun. So uh, this is just the student doing it on their own. So therefore, there is no time tracking in something like Math is Fun, but that's okay. In the Google Classroom, and I've said it, I, I will send out a follow-up uh, to this with um, the video that I created. I actually created two lessons in our, in our Georgia Google Classroom, one using Math is Fun acute angles and one using obtuse angles. And it prompted the, the teachers, you, to uh, go to the lesson to answer these questions and then complete a Google form. Then self-report how long it took you, how did you like the resource, and uh, what did you score on the resource. And it also asked them as a challenge to take a screen cap of the screen that shows how you performed because that's a way of verifying, okay, you actually did this and this is how you scored. It's fascinating because about 20 teachers have done it so far, and what I get to see is this column of the number of minutes that's, that all of the folks took. And I can literally drag over those and see the average. And so the average amount of time it took students to do this was 10 minutes, and then I can drag over their ratings, and the uh, rating for the lesson that I shared, the obtuse, uh, obtuse angles, was 4.8. So that's also telling me students you know, really responded well to this lesson, so this is a lesson that I will use in the future. Um, Math is Fun also provides really great feedback at point of use as students are working through problems, which is nice, whether or not they answer it correctly or incorrectly. So those are all the resources in, um, can we do some type of mobile simulation? So the, uh, the, this was a question that came from uh, one of the folks on, on the webinar here. So um, FET, you can actually uh, use the, those FET simulations on a mobile device. They, they do work on a mobile device. So um, they're all HTML5. 
And they do have some on the website that are older. They're phasing them out and switching them into HTML5 so that they can be operated on a mobile device. <coughs> um, in terms of just additional resources that are in your wakelet that I want you to be aware of uh, that are not in still blocks, uh, offline math practice, this is Common Core Sheets. We do have uh, links to all 5,000 plus worksheets in here that are aligned to the college and career readiness standards. And this is in the wakelet, and I believe I've also linked the, uh, the spreadsheet that has all of those links. So again, the question came up earlier, what if my students are completely offline or in corrections? This allows you to go to any of these topics. We've provided the standard, the TAB level, the TAB emphasis, and links. And if you click on that, it'll bring you here. What you see here is the range of activities for this topic, breaking apart tens and ones. And the thing about this, top, this standard is there's multiple topics within Common Core Sheets. This is just one of three, I believe. So there's interactive practice that is available if you want to share that out. There's flashcards that are also downloadable and printable that uh, focus on, on basic facts or even the problems within. But then for every single one of these topics, there's 10 worksheets and the ability to customize them. And so again, I said this is the standard and there's actually three different topics on this standard. So that means for this standard, there are 30 worksheets that you have available just for this standard. And again, the ability to create and customize sheets on your own. So just checking the chat. Yep, someone actually uses Common Core Sheets. So thanks for sharing that. One of my students loves Common Core Worksheets because you can get a lot of different versions of worksheets with each standard. Perfect, thank you for sharing that. Uh, another thing when we're thinking about, okay, so how is instruction happening if we're, if we're working offline? and some students might not be able to get into Zoom. If you're working with GED level students, uh, this is a YouTube channel called Light and Salt Learning. And it was developed by a GED educator in Arizona, who I had the pleasure of meeting last year at their conference. And she, um, she's been doing this forever because she knows that students leave or aren't able to come to class a lot sometimes, or they just drop for whatever reason. And she wanted to be able to allow them to continue learning even when they can't be coming to class. So she's created all of these video recorded lessons uh, in, in playlists. So uh, if we look at this probability and counting, there's 10 instructional videos in this playlist on probability and counting. Algebraic word problems, there's 21 video lessons that walk through an instructional video on solving different problems related to algebra, 37 on building algebraic reasonings. So she's created all of these videos that, again, this is an actual adult ed instructor that's walking through them. So again, instead of that sort of, you're spending your time in Zoom doing these types of things, here is like an adult educator that they can be learning from um, through video. And again, that's gonna take less sort of bandwidth than a Zoom meeting. And then your time together can be spent talking about, well, what did you learn during that video? Or, hey, we're going to work on a problem together um, while we are here face to face so that we can dive more into concepts. So these are great. Those are in the wakelet. Uh, another tool that's in the wakelet is called Visual Patterns. These would be great for, uh, it's in the wakelet. Someone asked, can we have a link to this? Uh, it's in that wakelet. And uh, hopefully someone can paste the wakelet link if, uh, they can just so uh, anyone who hasn't grabbed that can get to it. <coughs> Visual patterns is just full of uh, printables uh, that look like this. So there are various different um, patterns where students are asked to find the total number of tiles, in this case, in the 10th figure or the 43rd figure. So this is getting into algebraic equations and patterns and looking at strategies for solving problems like this, like make a table. But making a table is one way, but maybe we can create an expression that's going to allow us to figure out what's in the 43rd figure without having to do every single one. And in this case, we see there's a constant, there's a plus one with each of these, and then this sort of increases by four each time. So this is one times four, this is two times four, this is three times four plus one, so wait, wouldn't the 43rd figure be 43 times uh, 
four plus one. So it's th these would be problems that you might just have students do. Like you could so you could give them this problem, and they don't need to come up with an equation ahead of time. They could solve this. They they'd be taking their time counting, but they could figure it out. Do that ahead of time, and then spend time together talking about okay, what would be a faster way of getting to that answer? That's an algebraic concept. So they have really a, a ton of different problems like that on their website. Open Middle is a really great site as well for more of these open-ended sort of problems where there are many ways to solve the problem and you could again could assign it to students to do on their own and then spend time together talking about how what were your different approaches. So all of these problems have a closed beginning so it's the same problem but then in a closed end there is one right answer but there's lots of different ways that you could solve the problem. Here's one example, it's geometry at level D. Uh, so it's practicing coordinate plane and they have to create a square uh, and say the coordinates for that square, but they can only use the digits zero through nine at most one time each. Well, since this vertice, we've already used two and three, what students figure out really quickly is, wait a minute, uh, if I've used three already, I can't make the next vertice over here because that would be a coordinate of three. And I can't use, uh, excuse me, two. Uh, I can't use three as my X or Y coordinate because that's already been used. So suddenly this got a little bit more challenging because I'm gonna have to have an angled square. And again, there's a way to get to the problem and then you can talk together about the various approaches that students took. The last resource that's in your Wakelet is uh, the Math Learning Center. And again, in talking about what you might be doing together in class, these are virtual manipulatives. And if students have a computer at home, they can use these. If they have an iPad, they can download the app. Um, so it might not be something that you're asking students to use necessarily, but it's definitely helpful for you to focus on providing modeling to your students. Uh, the number tiles are in particular interesting. I was doing a workshop where we were using this to have, to have people share, write an expression that says how many tiles there are. And you could say four times two plus two times two, or you could say four plus two times two. So it's, it's really a, one simple sort of tile problem like this can open up a lot of different conversation and you can be modeling things for students in real time. Um, you can also share these with students, which is kind of nice. So I want to spend the last uh, 15 minutes here bringing all of these things together. And so we've now talked about a bunch of different resources, and they all sort of do different things, right? Some of them are practice, some of them are instruction, some of them are more exploratory and conceptual. So when we're looking at these, you know, FET and CK12, they dive deeper into concepts. And some of those ones I just showed with uh, open middle and uh, visual patterns, those allow you to get more into conceptual conversations. Khan Academy, is, it tends to be rote uh, in terms of video instruction, but it does provide instruction. CK12 has videos. Um, Light and Salt Learning has videos with an instructor, which might be a little bit more effective. Um, Khan Academy also has interactive practice, CK12 has practice, Flexbooks has practice, and Math is Fun has practice. So all of these resources do have practice sets available uh, for you to provide that. But those are things that students can be doing on their own. Maybe you'll walk through some of it together when, you're, when you are together, but certainly you wouldn't want to uh, spend the majority of your limited sort of real-time communication uh, walking through problems. <clears throat> and then obviously uh, Common Core Sheets has offline practice. In terms of all the other resources, uh, open middle, visual patterns, all of those can be downloaded and printed. CK12, the text can be printed as well. There's a printable version of them. Flexbooks, those are printable as well. So there's a number of those resources that you could print. And that's not just for offline settings like in corrections, but we know that students are locked out. Um, you know, obviously our current situation is raising, raising and elevating sort of the, uh, the, the issue of digital equity and access. So we know that some folks are, are gonna have to create packets for students, but all of those resources you can download, print, and provide packets to your learners. So that's how you wanna use those different resources. And then the, the question that I've been asking, you know, 
every single time is how do you actually want to coordinate and communicate out that access. So there's various tools for doing that. You could put them all in one place like a wakelet. So you could create a unit rates lesson, which I did and you'll see, that has all of those skill blocks activities that we know align and just put it in one place. And so here's the wakelet, go ahead and do that. You could also just share the skill blocks. Or you could take the individual activities and maybe share them out. Or you could share out the link to the wakelet or share out the link to the skill block so that that's how you're communicating it to them. Um, or you may be working in something like Google Classroom where it's kind of all in one. So you create the assignment in there. When you create the assignment, the student's gonna get notified um, if they have the app on their phone. So it's taking care of organizing the content and storing it, managing it in terms of you being able to assign it and grade it, and it's also taking care of the communication portion. However, when I asked the question at the beginning of this, what are you using? Most people said they were using multiple things, right? So if you create an assignment in Google Classroom, yes, the student is getting an alert, hopefully, but you might also want to send out a remind that says, hey, you have a new assignment in Google Classroom. It's due at the end of the week. So in terms of skill blocks, because we're going to go back to that, the question is, how do you want to use it? So again, it is a tool for finding content, and maybe that's all you want to do. You create all these skill blocks, and now you know these are the resources that I can pull from and use in my lessons virtually, in person, and that's it. I, it's great. I, I love having that because it's all in one place. Or I want to rearrange these in a manner that makes sense for my learners so that I can share it as is with them. Or um, sort of in both of these instances, I you know want to share this so they have it, but maybe this particular activity I want them to do on their own. So I'm going to copy the link for that and then paste it to them. <coughs> so that here's your skill blocks. It's always available to you. There's lots of things that you can use to learn. This is the specific activity within, skill, within that skill block that I wanna make sure that you do. Um, again, many of these resources that are in here, four out of the five actually that are in skill blocks allow you to assign content directly through Google Classroom. So again, that's really nice, but that notion of copy pasting the link, all you'd have to do is click on this. It will say copy the URL. You paste it into a tool that you want and then literally just type a message to your students, paste the link in and they'll be getting that um, assignment. In terms of creating standalone lessons, uh, you could again, share the skill blocks as is or you could customize them and pull them together in a wakelet. That allows you to add in more things than just the things that are in skill blocks. So that's one benefit, but it also allows you to add directions um, and other things that you might wanna have for prompts and supports for your students. So uh, those are all different options for ways to use skill blocks. Um, but now just looking at the tools themselves and coming back to this notion of blended learning. So remember, we were looking at there's teacher-led activities, there's collaborative activities, and then these are more individualized and personalized all around the same topic. If we're looking at unit rates, well, the communication tools that I'm gonna use are Zoom for, for real time or some sort of conferencing tool. Maybe Remind or um, WhatsApp or Padlet for collaborative work where I want students to be communicating. Again, maybe it's something as simple as I'm gonna share out a video or even a FET, and I'm gonna do it through Remind or WhatsApp because I want you to use the chat within there to sort of share like, what did you experience? What did you learn? What did you think? Um, what observations did you make? What did you discover? Um, so some of that collaboration that can happen in a texting environment, and we know students like to text, right? And then for the more personalized learning uh, or individualized, again, maybe storing it in a place like Wakelet or, or just the skill block itself, because then students have access to it. In terms of the content resources that you're gonna use in any of these sort of settings, so the more collaborative tools are these ones that are again more conceptually rich because they allow you to pose problems and have rich discussions around them. Whereas some of these other tools, which are more practice or just sort of direct instruction, those are things that you can be saving for the individual time and maybe creating assignments that students work on them at certain points in time. So I wanna go back to skill block just so, so I can just sort of walk through the notion of you know, what it might look like for rearranging things. 
So we have that FET, uh, which is a simulation. And I, again, think that's a great way to kick off any lesson because it's void of my objectivity or subjectivity of this is how unit rates works, right? This just allows them to explore. And I'll show you the unit rates activity in FET just so you can see it. This is what you'll see again on that screen that I just had, there was that Google Classroom icon. There's also a remind icon, but we're gonna do this shopping activity where I drag these lemons and I see a, a number timeline here, a double timeline. And I see that five lemons is $1.25. Um, and so I also see that 10 lemons oop, is uh, $2.50. So now the question here, it's asking me, well, what is one lemon? So I probably shouldn't have jumped ahead like that, but I could just sit here and remove these. And what you'll see is it's actually tallying uh, anything that's demonstrated on the scale. So I could just do this to get to this answer. So now I know that one lemon is 25 cents and I just click 25 and that's gonna go in here. So now it's gonna ask me the cost of 15 lemons. Well, I know five lemons is $1.25. And I know 10 lemons is, is 250. So do I have enough information to not have to use the scale to answer that question? Absolutely. Will all students be able to do that? No, but they'll still be able to answer the question because they can just you know, drag these lemons on here uh, and then get to 15. And then they will literally get to the answer. So this is something they could do on their own and answer these questions. And they could share how they got their answers and they're still doing math and maybe making some observations, but then you, when you're together with them, can walk through these and maybe use a different example like oranges, which have different rates here. So there's multiple opportunities for practice. And then say, if I know five, then is there a way for me to guess 15? Since I already know five. Um, if I multiply five times three, that's 15 oranges. So what would I need to do here? So that's where you, the teacher, come into play is helping them make those connections. But this is a perfectly acceptable activity for students to be doing on their own. So then I also like having the CK12 active uh, here because it just gives them multiple options. And then I'm gonna show the Flexbook lessons and maybe those are ones that I'm actually gonna walk through together. And then I want all my lessons up top, which makes sense because this is where the instruction is happening. And so this is another option for them. Maybe I'll make that first because math is fun tends to be sort of uh, simpler in nature in terms of the way that it presents content. And in the future, these might be the ones that I have up front because this might be the anchor of my curriculum, right? This might be what I'm always having students do in class. And so maybe I do want to bring those to the top, even though I know I'll still have them do the simulation ahead of time, that's flipped, right? I'll say, I want you to do this before we come to class, because then we're going to talk about it. And then you're going to get a skill block uh, that we're going to work through. So these might be my core curriculum that when we're back to normal, uh, that's what I'm going to sort of use as the spine. Great. You could still organize your skill blocks in that manner and then what's going to happen is you could just uncheck them and what that's going to show on the student side and i'll show you what the student sees is you just tell them hey the ones that are starred are required um, and these are optional which obviously they don't have access to but that's a way they could use that to say hey these are required things everyone else everything else is just if you want more more practice um, but that's a way that you could be using this tool so now i've organized this in a manner that I can share this with my students and they're gonna have access to. All I need to do is share this code with them and I'm gonna log out just so you see what it looks like from a student perspective. They would get to the screen when they go to skillblocks.org, they'd enter that code and now they're seeing this skill block from this perspective. And in the future, if this is something you wanna use, you can print these out and it becomes a hard copy learning plan for students where they have the URL, because obviously these URLs mean nothing if it's a piece of paper, but they have the URL and they have the code to enter in. And so this could be the thing that they're using to track their work um, on, a, on a hard copy and maybe they're turning this into you um, at the end of a unit of study. So it's pretty flexible in terms of how you might use it. I'm gonna hop into a wakelet that I created. Um, 
So I'll do that from here. So here are two wakelets that I've created and I will share out, but this is one on unit rates. So again, skill blocks just provides you with the, the playlist, right? Um, there's no instructions, there's no anything in there. That would be something I have to provide elsewhere. I could take those skill blocks and copy the individual activities and then create a wakelet uh, if my computer wants to chug and open this. I'm using, a, I have a lot of tabs open right now, so I think that's part of my problem. But I've created this wakelet that uses all of these tools, but I've also provided an introduction. Here's the concept, like price per gallon or uh, five apples for $2. I've used the math is fun lessons as sort of my vocabulary, because again, each of these things is a sort of overview of, of the topic on unit rates. So here's examples. So this gives examples of what a unit rate is. So it's a definition of unit rate. Um, and then I'm going to do a warm up, and this actually has nothing to do with skill blocks. I found a reading from one of the resources that I shared on Tuesday and Thursday that focuses on gas prices, so you know, price per gallon. So I've th thrown a little reading activity in here, and then I've got the simulation, and then I've got learn. So these are all of the things that, and I provide instructions, use one or more of these to learn the concept. And so I've pulled all of those things in here. And then I've got this concept check, and I say that they have to do the three quizzes. Um, and this will be the reporting that I see in Khan Academy for my students. So I'm, I'm getting that sort of at the tail end. So that's one of the beauties of Wakelets, is that you can string things together in a sort of lesson-based format um, if, you, if you want to. And again, once I've done that now in this sort of you know, weird environment where we're trying to learn tools, uh, that's available to me forever. And I can continue using those with my students. In terms of the pace of how you might use these resources with students, so um, you might share out a, a wakelet or a skill block at the beginning of the week and say, you know, this is the concept we're going to use and these are all the resources that we're going to use to learn it. <clears throat> and you might share that out through Google Classroom or Remind or WhatsApp. And then maybe you set lesson times. So on Tuesday and Thursday, we're going to have regular class times. And before you come to class on Tuesday, I want you, this is that flipped model, right? I want you to explore the unit rate simulation because we're gonna look at it together, we're gonna walk through things together, and we're gonna dive into the concept. So I want you to play with it beforehand and share some observations. And then on Thursday, we're gonna walk through the Flexbooks lessons, which had all four of those simulations, right? And I want you to do that ahead of time too, so you can share what you learned, and then we'll spend some time together and talking about why things worked or didn't work. Uh, and then maybe, and Zoom would be obviously the tool that you're gonna use for those. Then you might wanna just provide daily assignments for students. So again, these are things that students can work on on their own. And the way that you'll be communicating is through Google Classroom or through Remind. And then finally, doing an end of week review where we're gonna talk about all the things you learned, we're gonna talk about the concept, maybe you're posing a problem like the one I, I shared with the boxes and the prices, as a kickoff, or maybe you do a quizzes, which I'm gonna do in a second with you if you want to stick around on unit rates, um, to do a, a all together check to see if students understood uh, what they learned this week. So that's a way to use all these different tools for communication and sharing and the content tools together in one place. Um, I had mentioned earlier student self-reporting. I will share this video because again, for some of those things, I know it's important. Um, I have found this to be effective just in the Google Classroom as a tool uh, for people to share. The last thing that I'm going to share in terms of um, future webinars, because I'm for the, for the time being done <laughs> uh, with, with uh, doing webinars here with uh, the Georgia State uh, folks, but um, I would recommend EdTech Center at World Education, which is basically the leading organization on blended learning and distance learning in the United States for adult education. They have a set of strategy sessions every Friday. They are always bringing in a combo of an expert and a teacher. Um, and it's nice because one week one was on uh, just tools. I did that. I did a session on tools that was just 10 minutes, not 90 minutes. <laughs> and then a teacher uh, shared what she was doing with WhatsApp which uh, is, is a tool that is a, for communication. And she was using that with ESL learners and she had never used WhatsApp before. 
and she had gotten up and running and she had volunteered to share. And then we break out into groups based on whichever one you wanna talk more about and that's discussion based with folks. Last week, we looked at student self-reporting and the teacher verification model. This week, there's gonna be a policy talk from an expert on policy and just what's going on. But then there's also gonna be a teacher who shares HyperDocs, which is a way of taking something like a Google Doc. And you could literally, that thing I shared in Wakelet, you could put all those links into a Google Doc and have questions in there for students to answer in the Google Doc and then share that through Classroom, right? So then you're using one tool, Google Classroom, you're using skill blocks to find the resources, you're linking them into this one worksheet and then providing a sequence of things you wanna do and then the student just turns in that Google Doc with their responses to whatever prompts you've put in there. That's gonna be the topic tomorrow during the EdTech uh, Center strategy session. That link is here in the slideshow, so I encourage you to uh, check that out. Uh, so we're done, um, but I am gonna run a quizzes now if you're interested in seeing it, because this has been a fun way to end all of these. <coughs> quizzes is a tool that allows you to either create your own quizzes, uh, and it's weird to say quizzes, because it's quizzes and I'm saying quizzes, plural, but uh, and it's really hard to, I have to transcribe all of these videos afterwards, and it does not like the word quizzes because it always just spells it out. Um, so anyway, quizzes allows you to create a quiz on your own from scratch or to search their website and find quizzes and then add that to your library. And then you can assign them as homework as sort of do it on your own, or you can do it in game-based mode, which is what we're gonna do right now. And I think this would be a cool way to start off a week or even end a week on something that folks have learned. And it also is gonna give you a really good sense of whether or not learners understand because you get real-time reporting when you use quizzes. So I'm going to go to the quizzes website. And the one that we're looking at and gonna do right now, I did not create. Um, all I did was go, once I was in quizzes, I clicked on search. And, and as you see, I've done some searches by standards because people, if they're, if they're great, will tag the standard, and so then you actually have the ability to search by standard, which is nice. But I'm gonna search for unit rates, and I'm gonna see all of these different quizzes have been created on the concept of unit rates. Um, you know, some of them better than others. I literally just took the first one that, that showed up, and so I added it to my quizzes, so what I can see here is this is the original and it has been played 63,000 times, uh, but there's like 15 questions in there. So I just went it down to six questions for the sake of time with us, because I, I didn't want you all to have to <laughs> work through 15 uh, unit rate problems. Um, but all I have to do now, once I've done that, is click it and I see that I can play live or I can assign it as homework uh, or I can share it out in all sorts of different ways. Uh, I'm not gonna share what the questions are. And uh, I'm gonna play live. So we're gonna click on play live. And you'll see there's lots of options for playing live. I can um, allow for students to, uh, I can show the leaderboard or not show the leaderboard. I can shuffle questions. I can allow for uh, memes to show up. So you'll see as you're answering questions, there might be memes that show up for you. I can shut those off. Um, I could limit the amount of time it takes for each uh, response so that it's more sort of time-based, like you only have 10 seconds to answer a question. So there's all sorts of things I can do in terms of the settings. And then once I want to host the game, all I have to do is click host game, and now we're going to be live. And so all you have to do, and I'm going to type this into the chat, is go to joinmyquiz.com. And then you're gonna enter in the code 168564. You don't need an account. Um, this is automatic, you'll just be logged in. Uh, you could send that link to students on a remind. Uh, you could send it ahead of time or you can say, hey, we're gonna be doing a quiz at noon on Friday. So, you know, five minutes beforehand, you could share out the link. So I want you to go to joinmyquiz.com uh, and so Enola and Dorothy are the first two. Congratulations uh, for being the first two in here. I'm gonna allow time, because for many of you, this is the first time you've used this. And this is one of the things we need to think about as we're using new tools with students. 
So uh, you could do it on your computer, you could do it on your phone, um, which also just brings up the point that in class, you can still use quizzes, right? Because students do have mobile devices, and this is a really fun way for them to be actively engaged in answering questions and for you to get data to see if how they're doing on the concept itself. Did I type it in wrong? Okay, no, joinmyquiz.com. So we have nine folks in so far. <clears throat> I wanna get to about half of you and then we will start the quiz. So joinmyquiz.com and one, six, eight, five, six, four. I realize some of you might be juggling tabs here. So once you've gotten to joinmyquiz.com, the code is one, six, eight, five, six, four. So someone just said this app is really easy to use. Yes, uh, I think it is too. A lot of people have used Kahoot and Kahoot is another type of uh, app such as this uh, that allows for polling and asking questions in real time. Um, from those that I know that are sort of heavy Kahoot users, a lot of them have uh, been gravitating toward quizzes. Um, so I don't know if that, if that means anything to anybody, but if you've used Kahoot, keep using Kahoot. If that's what your students are used to, think about ways that you can use Kahoot in a virtual environment, you can. Um, all right, we only have 13 folks in, 14. So join my quiz .com. And then you enter the code, don't, don't, maybe you can add it all at once, but if you go to joinmyquiz.com, um, I've heard they, they like some more of the features in quizzes. Someone asked why they switched from, uh, to quizzes from Kahoot. Uh, I think they like more, the, there's more robust uh, reporting features is what it sounds like in quizzes than in Kahoot. But all right, we've got 14 folks in and for the sake of time, I don't wanna go any further. I'm gonna give you about uh, 20 more seconds to join, and then I'm gonna start the game. And I do have a timer. <laughs> All right, so I am gonna click start. So in we go, and you'll see that this is now live. And students who are playing are going to start getting questions. Um, and so what I see here is a leaderboard. So the second the first person answers, boom, they're going to get to the top. And so folks are answering questions. And you, as you're answering questions, see where you're ending up on the leaderboard. So your points is based on both answering correctly and the amount of time it takes to answer the question. You guys are awesome at unit rates. Oh, someone got one wrong. Because at that point, you were 100% accuracy. But this is still really good. So this is a really uh, cool feature. You're seeing the number of correct responses on the left and the number of incorrect responses so far on the right for the entire class. So um, your accuracy is just continuing to go up. The leaderboard is shaking up here. And you also can monitor like uh, how many questions students have answered. So there's a few students who are in who have not been answering, um, and that's okay. If you just wanted to go in to observe what you see, that's fine. So we have a handful of folks. Someone has already finished. Uh, someone else also finished. We've got a few people that have one more question to go. I can also, as this is going on, see how people are doing on each question. So I see uh, question one, 13 correct. Question two, everyone has gotten correct. Question three, everyone has gotten correct. Question four, one incorrect. Question five, a handful have gotten incorrect. Question six, uh, everyone's gotten correct. So great job, very accurate. I think you're gonna have a higher accuracy than uh, even this morning. So I'm gonna go back to the leaderboard and see where folks are. Very cool. All right, we'll go one more minute and then I'm gonna end the game just so we can see the reporting.
people are answering very carefully. I'm seeing lots of correct answers popping through. Very good, very good. All right, we've got a few people inching towards the end. Awesome. Some people are taking their time just to make sure they get everything correct, which is something you want to be mindful of. You don't want to create things that are going to make students rush and then ultimately, you know, not do well on this. All right, we got two that have five answered. I want to uh, give them the opportunity to answer the sixth. So I'm gonna allow two more answers to come in and then I'm gonna end the game. People are taking their time. Oh, I don't wanna lock people out. So two people have one more answer to go, so. Go ahead, answer. All right, I think that's everybody. Let's take a look. Yeah, everyone that played has uh, answered all their questions. And so you can see uh, how that works. So now I'm gonna end the game. It's gonna ask if I'm sure, because there is a player that did sign up, but just chose not to play and that's okay. So I am gonna say, yes, I wanna end the game. And now it's gonna give me my results. This gets a little obnoxious, uh, especially when you have a really large group, but congratulations to whoever me is. But it's fun to say me, I won. Um, it was not me, I did not play. But then it does this little parade, which is a little bit annoying um, when we have these large groups, but off it goes. Okay, bye, great job everybody. That's the mastery party. Uh, and then it gives you this interesting data about how students did. So class accuracy, overall, um, the class answered 88% of questions correctly. Um, the toughest question for folks was question five. So two uh, out of 21 players answered question five correctly. It was also the one that took the longest. So that's giving me sort of a heads up that question five is the trickiest question in here, or maybe it's the most challenging in terms of it's not immediately obvious as to what the answer is. And then the average time uh, taken per question was 31 seconds. I can download all these results, which is great, but then I can get a view for everyone in here in terms of how they answered on each of these questions um, and which ones they got wrong. Um, I have the ability, again, to look at question by question. So I see everyone got questions one and two correct. Um, only one person got three, everyone got four correct. Uh, two people got five correct and everyone got six correct. So you guys are great uh, overall on this. And then I don't have the standards tag to any of it, but again, um, some people have gone through the motions of doing that, which is awesome because that obviously provides a lot more enhanced reporting for you. And maybe that is something you do or don't do, probably not. That's a little challenging for folks to do when they're creating a quiz, but it provides really rich reporting and say students didn't do so well on this, right? And it was clear that question five was people bombed it. Well, then this is an opportunity for me to go, okay, well, let's go take a look at question five and, and do that as a class. We're gonna look at this um, because this was actually comparing rates, right? So this is a little bit more challenging. You have to find uh, the either the per unit cost or you could double this because remember that, remember the unit rates, the simulator on FET? Um, you know, if you had that conversation about, well, if I have five and I know how much that is, then if I just double that, then I'm going to know how many 10 is. That's a perfect example here, right? Where, okay, if I doubled six, that would give me 12. So I would double this and that would be $3.60. So I know the 12 pack is the cheaper of the two, right? So, um, that's where like that sort of type of thinking would only come to students through a conceptual lesson where you're having the conversation with them. And then, you know, here's a problem that actually gives them the opportunity to apply what they learned during that lesson. So thanks for staying a little over to play. 
Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining today. And if you joined on any of the previous webinars, um, I definitely appreciate it. I hope that the things that we have shared have been helpful to you. And I also just want to thank you for doing what you are doing. We are in a very strange time right now that is, uh, I think, new to everybody. And I love seeing, uh, you know, we, we see the amazing things that healthcare workers are doing and first responders are doing. Um, but I think teachers are also doing great things because they're having to step up to do things for their learners that are completely out of the box uh, and not necessarily comfortable to them. And so, you know, you coming to these trainings and learning how to do new things is inspiring. And it just goes to show that we have amazing adult educators that are so committed to their learners. Uh, yes, thanks for your time do. and hope to see you soon. Kevin, did you have something to say? No, oh, disagreeing with you, Jeff. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Have a great afternoon and, uh, and be well. Take care.